So I start. So the first seven, I just kind of skipped over. I just looked at um, briefly. So I didn't put them in here. I thought they were all pretty straightforward. Like the first ones are just about sets and things. And I'm like, okay, that seems those seem pretty straightforward. Um, so I looked at this first one, exercise eight. I decided to write this one out. Um, did you guys, anyone do exercise eight besides me? Did you say you did it? Yeah, yeah I, I, I looked at exercise eight, yeah. Okay. So this one seems somewhat straightforward. You know, just it's kind of like kind of a little bit of terminology review too. It says find the sample space. So, well, that's, I, I you know, what I wrote down is just this 36 ordered pairs, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And... And then it says find the set representing an event that the value of the first row is greater than or equal to the second row. So I wrote it like this is the pair is such that uh, IJ is in the sample space and I is greater than J. I'm not sure about this notation, but I, this, I know what I meant. I don't know. <laughs> um, this use of this logical end here is a little probably not quite the right way to do it, but that's kind of how I, I was thinking of it like a filter almost, right? So is that how, what do you guys think? Is that how you would write that, you think? I don't, I don't know. Not sure. Yeah, I was I was thinking, is it not uh like uh the notation doesn't seem very clear to me. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Me either. Uh, at least from from what I have seen in in such a scenarios, instead of using the the and symbol, I think it's more common to use a comma because sometimes the sets have has a lot of conditions. So simply a comma is comma. understood. That's, that makes much more sense. I'm going to change that. I think that is what they use in the book too. I meant to go back and look. A comma, yeah. That, I was going to say, there's going to be some simple way to do that. Thank you. So I just noted that there are 21 elements in that set, which is, seems easy to, to think about, right? Because for... Uh, if the first die is a six and there's only one if the first die is a five then there's two that are greater than equal to and so on right so that's six plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one is 21 21 elements it didn't ask us to do anything with that information it's just uh, this is just a set um a set exercise but if we could immediately say oh what do we want to know the probability that that outcome would happen we would say it's 21 divided by 36 and reduce that down right yeah. uh, which i can't do uh seven well, no. Yeah, so 12th, I think. Uh, then uh, this says find the set B corresponding. Oh, I rewrote that wrong. B equals. Um, find the set with the first rolls of six. Well, that's pretty straightforward, right? It's just that set. And then, uh, then it said let C correspond to the event of the first value rolled and the second value rolled differ by two, and then combine the intersection of those two. So that's the intersection of A and the C, which we didn't write down, but it's pretty clear that if this, if, the, if it's in A, then the only ones that could be lower, the only ones that could be different by two are the ones that's smaller. So I just wrote, wrote it down. I don't know, I didn't think there's any any other, any way to really show my work more than that, but I just wrote down. I mean, if, if the first roll is a six, then it can't be, you know, it has to be greater, it has to be a less than or equal to. So it's gotta be the only one that could differ by two is a four and then so on, right? That's what I got. Did that concur with what you did? I assume. Uh, yes, but uh, I prefer to, uh, I mean, instead of showing the, the explicit set definition to display it in a, in a grid, like, like a matrix in where every square represents the pair y comma j. Uh, yeah. So it's a little bit easier to to, to count the possibilities in, in that, in that yeah, drawing. The matrix, yeah, I agree. That's, that is true. I did do that last week in the, in the chapter part of it. I made a little matrix to make it easier to count the die outcomes. Speaking of dice, we're back at it again for exercise nine. In this case, the spare pair of dice are rolled, find the sample space, but we already did that. Um, that's the previous exercise, right? Same sample space. Um, then it says find the probabilities of these three different events. And so I, I just kind of did these in kind of word style. Again, uh, it says, well, if the sum is even, then you know that no matter what the first die is, half the results of summing with the second die is going to be even because that's what they have to, you know, the other, um, if the other second dice is even, then in the, the first dice is even, and the second dice is even, you got an even and so on, right? So it's just, you just think it through a little bit. I don't want 
belabor it, but it's pretty obviously there probably is a half. So for fun, I just made a little R program to verify that, right? This is that table you're talking about, actually. So I just made a table, the first die and the second die. That's what this part is. And then I just created the sum and I said, okay, give me the, how many of them are, how many of those rows are uh, even? And there's 18. Okay, so 18 out of 36 is a half. That verifies my reasoning, right? Just counting. Uh, what's the probability of this first row is equal to the second? Well, that's clearly one over six. That's not difficult to see. Um, then what's the probably the first rule is larger than the second. Well, this is similar to what we did in the previous thing, the same kind of seven outs larger, not larger than or equal to. So again, just considering each case, there's so there's 15 of those. Uh, we can check that again with the dice table, right? Just filter all the rows with die two is greater than die one, and yeah, there's 15 rows. That verifies my math here, right? That seems does that seem pretty clear? I, I kind of went through that pretty quickly because I think it's pretty straightforward, but just for completeness, I thought I would talk through it. But. I hope I didn't rush through that too fast. Does it make sense to everybody? Any questions about that? Yeah, I think I got something it's similar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you want to go through this exercise 16. This is kind of more of a math one. Uh, maybe I will talk through it just briefly. So this is called Bonferroni's inequality, which is kind of an interesting inequality. I, I should have wrote this bigger, but it's the it's similar to the union bound, except now it's for an intersection. It says the intersection of two sets A and B is going to be bigger than, I'm sorry, the probability of the intersection of two sets A and B is going to be bigger than the sum of the probabilities of the individual sets, uh, events, I should say, right? Minus one. Um, so that puts a kind of a upper or say lower bound on the size of the intersection. Or I should say the probability of the intersection. I keep saying size, but I guess it probably is a measure. It's kind of a size, right? So, uh, so I, I suppose that's useful. I've never actually seen that before, but um, okay, fine. So the trick to deriving this, I won't go through all the steps, but the trick, if you want to look at it yourself, is to use De Morgan's law to turn because we have we have this union bound. We should use that. So just use De Morgan's law to turn this intersection, which we don't know anything else about how to deal with, to a union, which we do know how to deal with, right? Using De Morgan's law, um, which is extremely useful and comes up all the time. And then you can use the fact, so we've got the complement. Uh, well, this it's hard to say this, but it's easy to see. <laughs> and, you know, the probability of a complement is one minus the probability. So we can use that to get rid of one of those complements. Uh, and then we can use the union bound on this expression, right? Which we do know, there's the union bound. Then, then we just go through the, turn the crank and out comes the answer, right? That's basically the approach to that. And you, the other one, the more general case of n events is, uh, the same kind of thing, basically, but with more, right? So here I used induction to do it. You can also use the 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 uh, uh, multivariable union bound that it gives as a possibility uh, as a uh, in the exercise, right? What does he call that? Not a multivariable. It's called the uh, generalized union bound, yeah, to do it in, instead. But I just did it by induction here. So I'll post these later if you, if you want to look at it in more detail. But the only thing that, to note there is that the trick there is just to know to use De Morgan's law to turn that frown upside down. <laughs> did uh, you guys? I mean, didn't... I think I think I have to look this again. You know, <laughs> it's a bit confused with <laughs> with it. Yeah. Uh, I did it in a different way. Oh, okay. Uh, because, for example, uh, we we saw a formula, right? That the probability of the union. Is a sum of the individual probabilities minus the yeah. probability of intersection, right? So, yeah. if we, if yes, we were to right. use the fact that the probability of a, a union B is bounded by one, and then simply replace the other expression, uh, it does. Uh, it, it's a, it's actually a little bit faster. We we don't need the, the Morgans. Uh, you know what? That's actually a really good idea. I I, I didn't think of that. Yeah, you could just use. I mean, just instead of using the union bound, you could just, I mean, that's basically just kind of put the der derivation of the union bound into this, so you didn't have to use it. And maybe that does clean it up a little bit by taking out some, also cleans up a little bit because it's a little bit messy. I, I didn't, I should put another step here because why, you know, why, because this negative sign here kind of makes this a little confusing because I have to use, turn a less than from the union bound to a greater than because I have a minus sign here and that's just, you know, 
it's a little it's a little like another thought you have to have so it's easier if you'd probably do it your way we just use the uh the intersect the, the full formula for the uh, inter overlapping set union yeah i like that that's a good idea okay any uh go on to exercise 19. um how many did i do just a few okay we got a little more ways to go all right so let's see 19 uh let's see that one was this binary communication system thing um so the the story here is you've got a, a, a communication system that transmits a signal with a plus two or minus two voltage signal but there's some malicious uh agent in between there who flips a coin or flips two coins sorry and depending on what he gets oh the table didn't render very well it's in, in the book it probably renders it's better but let me make a note see if I can fix that render. I should use a proper table. I just some of this is just cut and paste problem from the book. Um, but the idea is if the if the guy if the malicious agent flips two heads, he doesn't do anything. This he, he just replaces the signal with zero. <laughs> if he gets no heads, he leaves the signal alone. And if he has one head, he just kind of reduces the signal by half. That's basically what the problem statement is. Okay. So it's going to add some kind of noise, but it's kind of a very regular type of noise. And it says further assume that the probability of having a, the original signal being plus two or minus two is equal. So then it says the first thing you want to do is find the sample space of y. And well, the sample space of y is simply the possible outputs of possible results and possible outcomes, which are minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two, because those are the by examination, right? You can see those are the possible outcomes of the experiment. And now we need to know the probability of each of those outcomes, which we can compute for each case uh, directly, right? So we know that, for example, um, what's the probability of a two? The only way to get a two is to have X has to start out as two, and then we have to have no head. That's the only way that can happen, right? And oh, we can multiply these probabilities because these are um, independent, right? The, 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 the flipping the coin and the signal uh, plus or minus is are independent, so we can just multiply the probabilities of those two things. Uh, so the probability of x e uh, equals two is a half, right? Because they're plus two and minus two are equally likely. And the probability of having uh, no head, well, that's one quarter, right? Because you have to get uh, a no head on both of the coins. And each coin is also independent. So that's another multiplication I kind of just did uh, behind the scenes there, but yeah. Um, so that's one eighth of the probability that the signal turns out to be a two. For one, you, Again, you have to multiply it by half, but now what's the probability of only having one head? Well, that's uh, one half, right? There's two ways out of the four possible head tail outcomes that you can get one head. That's so you get one quarter there. And probability of, of zero, right? So zero only happens when there's two heads. It doesn't matter what your signal is, he's just going to maliciously turn it into a zero, and that happens one quarter of the time. And the minus cases are exactly the same as the positive cases, right? Just uh, as far as the probability outcomes. And then he asks us to compute the probability of getting an x equals two, right? Uh, signal given that you observed y equals one. What was the probability that the original signal was a plus two given that the um, uh, that we saw a one in the channel? Well, the probability is clearly one, right? I mean, just by inspection, we know that you can only get positive signals if the original positive signals with the error uh, only if the original signal was positive. But we can work it out in a little more detail just to check, and we say, okay, the probability of Two given y equals one is the intersection of probability of x equals two and y equals one divided by the probability of y equals one. And we just stick in those things, right? We know what those are and we get one. So it works, right? Probably y equals one, we compute up here is one quarter. And the probability that x equals two and y equals one is, again, it's the only part of that calculation uh, up here, but it's the same thing, right? It's just what it's a. Uh, uh, we, need, we need x equals two, so that's one, uh, one half, and we need y equals one that's also going to be one half, right? So it's a quarter. Yeah. All right. So, and the same thing for the other one, what's probably the y equals one, given that x equals minus two, that's got to be zero because again, positive signals are only, and this probably only associated with positive um, outcomes. And, but you can do the same kind of intersect. You can do the same kind of, you can write it out formally and get the same result, right? 
That seemed pretty straight. I mean, it seemed like a lot of the most of the work of this one is just just thinking about the sample space a little bit. And once you got that down, the rest of the problem kind of just falls out automatically. Although I admittedly did not check, you know, <laughs> the video solution. So I, I should check that and make sure I didn't I made some crazy blunder here. Did anyone look at these? This one, the video solution. Anyone look at this one at all? Uh, this one I looked at the video solution. Yeah, it's uh, it's a. Uh, Did I yeah, get it right? Like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't go to the details. He just say, you know, oh, the answer is this. It's that. Yeah. Because okay. yeah. at some point I was stuck and I looked at the video solution. Ah, okay. Well, hopefully my explanation helped a little bit. All right. So this next one is a machine. So this is some machine is producing um, like less widgets, I guess, and it makes errors at a certain in a certain operation with probability p. And within that, whenever that error happens, there's two types of errors that happen: a fraction of them are type alpha, fraction alpha are of type a, and a fraction one minus alpha are of type b. Right. So we want to know the first thing asks: um, what is the probability of k errors at n operations? And well, I mean, I just wrote it down because I know this is a binomial. <laughs> thing maybe that's not the intent i didn't look at the video solution for this was there a video solution for this one yes there is i should look too but i mean the by it's it should be also kind of self-evident that if there is not self-evident but you can talk through why this formula on the right makes sense in this case if you don't if you don't just reach in your bag of tricks and recognize this as a binomial um distribution Right, because you just have to think through. Well, okay, well, what's the probability of a particular ordering, right, of k errors and n minus k good, I guess, <laughs> right? So yeah, k duds and the rest of them are all good. Um, so the pro in a particular order, that probably just going to be p times p times p for the k times, then one minus p one minus p for n minus k times, which is just what this expression p the k times one minus k, and then we just have to calculate the, or, you know, the number of permutations of that, or the number of combinations, I should say, right, which we know from previous chapters, n choose k. So that's the total probably is the sum of all those possible orderings of those errors in that mass. Does that make sense? Or is it, or is it just fine to just pull the binomial distribution out of your hat there? What do you guys think? Did you guys do this problem? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't done this. Okay. I failed to finish this one, but but uh, binomial is also in my head. Okay. So then we can, I, sh I should look at the video solution to this one too. I, I meant to do the look at the video solutions to these and I ran out of time, got distracted by other things. Uh, so what was I saying? Okay, so for what's probably of K1 type A errors, what's well, just, just the same thing, except now instead of P, we have alpha P. That seems clear, right? Because the fraction of out of all the things that happen, how many of them are of type A errors is going to be, or I should say, the, what's probably being a type A error is going to be alpha times P, right? Because that's the fraction of the total events. And the same thing for the type 2 errors, 1 minus alpha goes in there instead, since that's the other fraction, right? Combined probability. So up, in, up until here, it's all pretty straightforward. Then you get to part D, <laughs> which is like, oh, okay, wait a minute. What's the joint probability of getting K1 type A errors and K2 type B errors in those N operations? And they give you a hint, right? They say, okay, how many possibilities are there of having K1 type errors and K2 type B errors? And that's this uh, multiplication of these two um, binomial coefficients, right? And so I'm going to ignore that for a second. Now I'm just going to say, okay, now again, like I did before, I'm just going to consider a particular order, right? So I've got... Um, K1 type A errors, I'm just going to line them up in order. I know there's other orders possible, it's only got one order. There's K1 type A errors. Then I follow it up with K2 type B errors. Right? In my mind, there's like a long list of, of widgets that have K1 problems and I have, uh, I'm sorry, A problems. And then I got K2 widgets lined up that have B problems on it. And then the rest, N minus K minus K2 are good, right? They're, they're fine. They have no errors at all. So the probability of that particular outcome, that particular outcome, uh, uh, is what I've written here, alpha P to the K, right? That's the first type error, that's the type A error. One minus alpha P to K2, that's having the type B error. And then the non does, it's just one minus P for all the rest of them. That's the, probably that particular 
order. Does that make sense to everybody what I'm saying here? That's, you know, if I just take a particular ordering of the errors in time or how we want to line them up, that should be the probability of that particular one. Just multiplying all those probabilities together. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So the, um, so that's one order though. We need to consider all the orderings and add them all up, right? Uh, probability of all these different events, right? We have to add them all together because they are disjoint. We can add them together, but we do need to uh, count them. And that's, they gave you the answer, right? That this is it, right? The counting is, uh, this is how many possibilities there are. So we just multiply that on there because all the probabilities are each of those orderings is all the same. So we just have to add them all up. We have to count them essentially. And uh, that's what this answer is. And uh, I do try to give some kind of explanation here why that makes sense. And let's see if I can, I'll just read this and see if I can remember what my thinking was. <laughs> Honestly, not sure what it was at the time. All right. So I guess, oh, okay, right. So this does make sense. So first just consider the type A errors. How many ways are there ordering the A errors amongst, there's a spelling error in there. Among, oh no, it's okay. Okay, uh, among I might say there. Uh, how many ways are there of ordering the type A errors where I don't, or amongst all the rest, where the rest can both has type B errors and non, non duds in there, the, the, the good ones. Um, I don't care about their order right now. All I care about is where these particular, these type A errors are in that long line of, uh, of events. Now, what, so that we know is N choose K1, okay? Because we're just ignoring the fact that the others have two different possibilities. And once we've done that, then we take just those remaining ones, which is N minus K, and choose how to order the B errors among that. When that's N minus K1, right? That's how many there are now, uh, choosing K2. And we should multiply those two together to get the total number of possibilities, and that's what, what the answer is. So that's my kind of wordy way of trying to derive that. It's not by no means a proof. Um, by the way, it's, I noticed one thing is interesting. It's better work both ways, right? Because uh, I could have started with a K2 and you know first and then done the K1 amongst the remaining ones, which would be this expression on the right here instead. But I noticed if you write out explicitly what this is in terms of factorials, you get um, this, which is symmetric in the K1 and K2. So it does, it does make sense that um, it doesn't matter which way. You could start with the type B errors and then order those and then or the type A errors afterwards. So it doesn't matter, which it shouldn't, right? So I didn't look at the video solution, but I wasn't sure I got the right answer with this thing right here. So I did a little simulation here as well. Um, I'll find some way to like, uh, like John did of posting these things at the end. So you guys can play with it if you want to. Mark down oh, documents. But I get, uh, is, it, is it at the GitHub uh, repository? No, it's not because John didn't want to share these. Uh, um, but there's some on my own GitHub, so I can share that, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe you can share your own. Yeah. You can, yeah. yeah, I'll do that. But um, so I, I said do a little simulation so that I, I walk, just talk through this briefly so you can verify it later. But uh, there's a, I decided to do 100,000 simulations and I decided within each simulation, I'm going to do 100 operations, right? That's what this was, operation. I kept saying widgets, but I guess it's supposed to be operations in a machine. So 100 operations, the total probability of a failure, I put at 1% and then I said, okay, let's have a type error, A error be 70% of those. And so I just went through and made the simulation. So here's my sim machine. I sample good A and B. Um, for size and ops, replace true. This I use these probabilities um, here, right? So the, the good ones are come with probability one minus p. Uh, alpha a errors come with probability p times alpha, and b errors come with probability p times one minus alpha. And just do the sampling, and then just add up how many um, how many were of uh, a and b errors in there, right? And count them up. So. I used this one example. I did that machine simulation. I said, okay, what about K1 equals two and K2 equals one, just as an example. Uh, and I calculate the probability, but I just calculate the mean uh, that, of those, that fraction, right? And I get 0.0277. And that, and I do the, here I just write out the analytical thing in R and calculate, and I get the same answer within 
numerical a- accuracy. So I figured, hey, I should, I did test a few more than this in my on my own, but uh, my my uh, verification through uh, simulation seemed to support that this was the right answer. Let me put it that way. <laughs> That's not a proof, right? <laughs> this is supposed to be the proof up here, but it is a uh, verification that I didn't make some kind of numerical blunder somewhere. The other way to do that, of course, is just to look at the video solution, which I did not do. Did anyone look at the video solution for 21? Did I, did this similar to what they did? Uh, no, I haven't looked at the solution. Okay. Let's see. This one I thought was, oh, this is why I kind of got my uh, terminology confused because this one is about defective chips. And that's why I was mixing, sorry about that. I was mixing my terminology up in the previous one. It was supposed to be operations, not widgets. And I kind of went back and forth. I hope that didn't completely throw everybody off. Okay, so this one, a computer manufacturer uses chips from three different sources, A, B, and C. I think it maybe has three different factories um, that make the chips. And the chips from source A have a def- defect probability of 0.005. Chips from uh, factory B are better, 0.001. And from C, well, they seem, I don't know what they're doing, but they get a 0.01 uh, defective uh, probability coming out of there. And we get most of our chips, looks like, uh, get the chips from A, B, and C in that proportion, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.1, and 0. 0.4. And so uh, the experiment is we have a randomly selected chip and it's found to be defective. We wanna find the probability that chips are from A. That's the problem state, well, the first problem statement, I guess, right? Uh, there's three parts of this one. Let's check something, yeah. Oh, so there's three parts are just, find the probability there from A, find the probability there from B, and find the probability there's from C, All right, Those are the three possible out uh, places they could come from. So first thing we're gonna wanna know is what is the probability overall of getting a, a dud? And we use a lot of total probability to do that. So it's just, you know, it's pretty straightforward. We just add up the three possibilities. If they're the probability, that, which, you know, I remember the law of total probability to get the probability of a dud, we just need to Use a con- we can condition on which factory it came from, probably a dud from probably from A, which we do know, 0. 0.005, times the probability that did come from that factory, which is 0. 0.5, right? So you just do the same thing with the other three factories and you get the total uh, probability that we have a dud in our process right there. And the reason why I needed that, because I know, because uh, I already did the problem, uh, I, that I'm going to need that to calculate um, the, pro- the, bre- the probability that, I have that the thing came from A, given that I have a dud. So to calculate the probability that the uh, widget, uh, that the chip came from A, given that it was a dud, I need to turn that around using our Bayes rule. So we turn that around, probably that it's a dud. Um, if it did come from A, times, probably the, times the prior probability that it came from A, divided by P dud. Well, we've already done all this math. We just pull the, the relevant parts down. We can calculate the total probability and do the same thing for B and the same thing for C, right? And you can check that these add up within round years. This was a really small probability, so it um, there'll be a little 0.05 possibility there. H- hang on one second. Uh, so I hope that this is helpful, but I'm just trying to show here that I guess the point of this exercise is just kind of like, oh, this is how you can use Bayes rules to solve a problem, essentially, right? And these kind of problems do come up quite a bit in data science, where this is like almost like a simple data science problem, where okay, the data is that we've got a um, randomly selected uh, chip is found defective, we're going to uh, infer, right, what the probability, what, you know, which factory it came from. And from our, 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 our posterior distribution here, we of A, B, and C, we find out that, oh yeah, most likely it came from B, but we can't be sure. It could have also somewhat likely come from A, and it probably didn't come from C, right? And we actually have numerical probabilities to report for those as well. Does that make sense? I hope so. Everybody's still here? At least everybody. We saw some. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so I think that's just kind of a, a quick. In, and this is the last one I did. I didn't do the twenty-five because it looked like it was going to take a long time, and I just ran out of time. So, so I did twenty-four. This one I, I thought was interesting because it's you know another kind of Bayesian type question, right? So. Um, the, the, now our two things we have we have coins one one co- they're both coins are biased one has a probability of heads of a third and the second coin has a probability of heads of two thirds and we're going to reap the put the two coins basically in a bag shake it up reach your hand in there and grab one of the coins at random so the probability of grabbing coin one is a half and the probability of grabbing coin two is a half so 
the first uh, question they ask A is what is the probability that um, uh, when if you know if you were to oh sorry the, the experiment is now you're going to do that three times right um, no let me make this clear because there's two ways you could think of this what they meant here but I what I'm pretty sure what they meant is that they take one of the two, well, I guess this is pretty clear, but you could potentially interpret it a different way. But my interpretation was you reach into the bag, grab one of the two coins at random, and then you flip that coin three times. That seems to be what they're saying, right? It is possible you could, you know, imagine a different experiment where I reach in the, over and over again and pull different coins out. But that wouldn't be a very interesting problem because we're trying to figure out is there a way we can tell which coin it was from the result of the experiment, right? Uh, so we take a coin at random, pull it out, we don't know which one it is, we flip it three times, and we count the number of hats, okay? That's the experiment. Is that the way you guys read this problem, if you if you did it? That's probably maybe reading too much into it, thinking it was not clear. Uh, I didn't do it, but oh, okay. uh, the, um, the interpretation that you are doing seems, like I think it's the same way. Okay, cool. So the first A, problem A is what is, and problem A and B together are gonna to ask you, what is the probability that the number of heads is three, or zero, one, two, and three, that's A and B kind of combined. So first thing we do three, because three is the easier case. Um, so again, we, we don't, what's the probability that we get three? Well, we got to condition that on which coin it was, right? And so we know that um, if it was coin, so that's what I'm doing here, I'm just using the law of total probability again, that if probability of uh, K equals three, so which I have written out here. I'm not going to read it out, but I have written out here. And we just calculate the different parts. We know the probability of the coins, coin one versus coin two is a half. So that's the, that's this two in the denominator here. And the numerator is just the probability that uh, uh, for getting three heads from coin one, well, that's P1 cubed, right? And the probability of getting three heads for coin two is P2 cubed, where P1 and P2 are these numbers given up here. And then if you put the numbers in and and do the math, you just get one six. So the probability when I reach into the bag, grab a coin at random, flip it three times, getting three heads is one over six. Okay. And then we do the same. So uh, let's see. For k equals zero, it's got it's this it's the um, oh so I you can write out in general what that has to be just by using the binomial distribution, and that's what I've done up here, right? So if I reach into the bag and um, um, probably coin one and coin two is both a half, so that kind of factors out into this numerator, our denominator here, I'm sorry. And then we just have to calculate the two terms on the top, one for coin one and one for coin two, and they're similar terms are just this binomial distribution, right? Three, choose K, P1 to the K times one minus P, three minus K, right? That should be hopefully straightforward since we've done that before in a previous problem. It's the same idea. And then I just plug the numbers in for k equals zero, k equals one, k equals two, because I'm going to need those for the next part of the problem for sure, right? Bloom, bloom, bloom. So then it asks in the part C, what's the, find the probability that coin one was tossed. So here we're doing this inference again. What is the probability that coin one was tossed for these, uh, given the number of uh, heads was k? So here we are going to use Bayes' rule. By the way, you'll notice that the law of total probability and Bayes' rule come hand in hand all the time. Um, this kind of expansion into disjoint sets and this kind of reversing your conditioning is a very uh, common pattern in, in, these, in these problems and also in, in data, in Bayesian data science anyway. So Bayesian analysis, I should say. So, all right, so I wanna know what's the probability of coin one given that I found K heads. Well, that's the probability I get K heads given it was coin one, which we've already calculated up here in, as part of this problem. And I realize now I should have probably pulled that out as a separate step, but well, anyway, I failed to do that before I post it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's just this binomial thing uh, right here, divided by P of K, which we computed up there, right here, right? and times a half because we know the probability of getting coin one is half. That's just P of coin one. And I, does that make, does that make sense what I'm doing? Did I talk through that slowly enough? Should I go back and look, do some more of this? Is everybody following along with this derivation? Let me know. For me, it's uh, clear so far. Yeah. 
Okay. The only thing I regret doing is not pulling out this kind of piece of K coin one type calculations separately so it's clear that's what this part up here is. <laughs> but anyway, because I'm using it again here. Or not, yeah, sorry, here, the top, the numerator. So the numerator is just the binomial uh, distribution for getting K heads in three tosses with the probability is P1 since we're using coin one. Okay, anyway, I kind of talked to it myself, just make sure I understand it, but yeah, I got it out. So, in, and then finally in part D, it says, okay, from part C, which coin is more probable? Now we're doing the real inference. We've observed two heads. So now we're gonna plug in two into this expression. And I use R for that because I don't want to use my piece of paper, so I just put P1 is one third, P2 is two thirds. So, you know, just plug it in, right? Um, three is the binomial coefficient, uh, two is the probability of choosing coin one, and then this is the binomial. I'm sorry, three is not the binomial coefficient. Uh, this is the binomial coefficient right here, right? Three is uh, the one over P of two, right? So P of two is one third so one over p of two which is right here in the num numerator or denominator uh, excuse me to my dyslexia is growing in the denominator is makes that three here right the two is just this two from the half and then finally the expression for this binomial probability um the conditional probability of two, of seeing two coins uh, give out of three heads of coin one uh, is this expression right here right and you value it all you get one third so uh, if you do the same thing for coin two, didn't actually do that, but you bet I, just as a check, I want to make sure it worked if I, I get two thirds for coin two. So it's more likely that coin two is the source of the two heads out of three. Yeah. So that's that problem. That's all, that's all the ones that I did. Um, uh, any questions about any of these or anything else you guys want to discuss about these kinds of problems or any problems you want to talk about, let me know. Move this over here so I can see you. I think it's quite interesting. Um, given the fact that I've not done this, I, I think um, it's going to be very helpful, you know. Okay, good. And, you know. uh, Lucio, any, uh, any closing it, comments? There was uh, a little part that I have. I, I am not still completely confident about. Uh, I think it was. Uh, could you go up because it was in the previous program? Twenty-two. Uh, the previous one, maybe. Twenty-one, whatever. This one. And the previous one. Uh, Nineteen. Yes, sir. Uh, when you calculate the probability of uh, y being minus one, um, what is it one fourth? Well, it's the same as the probability. Well, it's based by symmetry because the probability of one was one fourth. So I just I'm just using symmetry there. I know that the, the the problem is symmetric about the positive minus, right? So it has to go through exactly the same way for probably a minus one, <clears throat> right? So it's going to be the probability that x is minus two because that's the only way you can get a minus one, and times the probability of one head, right? So that's one half times one half. It's the same thing. It's the same as this except put x equals minus two. Because remember, one head is what takes a signal and divides it by two. So I didn't write it out because it's just symmetry. It's a, the problem's the same, symmetric about the zero outcome. If that makes sense. Also, I'm lazy. No, <laughs> it sort of is why I do. Does that make sense now? Uh, yes. I, okay. I was confused because I, I thought that uh, when when you computed such probability, you were actually computing uh, the probability that in two coin tosses there's only one head, but not right. It had to be multiplied by the other probability. Yeah, so it X is. Yeah, to. yeah, right. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, you can think of the other way around, right? So what's so probably one head is a half. So in that situation. 
where our nefarious agent has got one head, we know what he's going to do. He's going to take the signal, whatever it is, uh, and divide it by two. So that's not how the problem states it, but you can just see in the table that's what happens because if he gets an X minus, he gets a minus two signal comes in, he puts out a minus one signal. If he gets a plus two signal come in, he puts a plus one signal out. So other other cases where he gets one head, half of them are going to be minus one, half of them are going to be uh, plus one, right? That's another way of saying it in a long wordy way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's helpful to talk them through like that, though. So I like to do that just to help me solidify the understanding. Okay, Lucio, have do any anything else? Thank you. Appreciate your being here and. Uh, let me talk through these a little bit. It does help, you know, to do the, one of the things that helps me when doing these chapters is when you do the exercise like this, you have to do them a little bit more detail. If I was just doing this on my own, I would have just hand writ, wrote these. And so I've got to practice some, uh, you know, some math, writing math equations with LaTeX and, or LaTeX. And I can't, I'm never sure how to pronounce that, but uh, yeah, this one. Sorry, I keep scrolling around. Let me just, uh, Stop sharing. Here we go. Yeah. And uh, I think that's it. I, are, we, are we meeting next week? And who's doing what? I should just check. Usually John would do this, but he's not here. So we just double check. Here. There is a break next week. Uh, yeah. There is a break. You're right. There's a break on the 28th, which is good. And then, oh, Lucio, you're going to take on discrete random variables. Awesome. I look forward to that. Oh, it's like a, a one week, one week break, I guess. Yeah. So 28th, we're not here. So next week we won't be meeting, but the fourth will be the next time. And that'll be Lucio doing discrete yeah. random variables. So be awesome. All right, guys, if there's nothing else, I will bid you adieu. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot for it. So uh, I, I, I guess a lot of work has gone into like preparing the, the slides and all that, you know, yeah, I mean, it's kind of a, a, it took a little time, but it was fun and helped yeah. me, helped me a lot to solidify these concepts. So yeah. to reinforce them, yeah, thanks. you know, let's say, if you want to really learn something, teach it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or in this case, redo the chapter as it were, right? But yeah, so Lucio is going to be our expert on discrete random variables. And I look forward to that. <laughs> yeah. No pressure. So. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.